Happy Sabbath, church. I'm really excited to continue the series I started last week, By His Wounds We Are Healed. Um, And so if you're a guest and this is your first Sabbath tuning in or maybe you missed last week's sermon, I want to encourage you, if you're not watching this live and you're watching it after it's been broadcasted, go watch the first one first. But if you're watching live, I encourage you to go back and if you haven't seen the first one, go watch it later. Um, But I'm super excited that you guys are here. Um, We're going to be diving deep, deeper into how by Jesus and by his wounds, we are healed. Amen. Um, And so I just want to kind of give a little bit of a recap that we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about how Jesus, in every single aspect, in every single way, has experienced some form of the sufferings that we experience in our lives. Because During the last moments of Jesus' life, I took everyone through that and I said, and I talked about how Jesus was abandoned by his closest friends that he spent with three and a half years. And then I also talked about how he was even betrayed by Judas, one of his best friends. And then I also talked about how he was rejected alone, abandoned, physically violated by the people who he came to save. And so the whole point was that Jesus relates and understands the things that we have gone through. And in him, we trust in him because he proved that him going through that all the way to Calvary shows us that we are no longer abandoned, no longer rejected, and no longer have to live in accordance and under and through the lens of the things that have happened to us because why? Jesus on the cross proves that we have value and that we are loved. It's good news. That's why it's the gospel. I just want to talk about this a little bit because traditionally, what do we say the gospel is? Traditionally, Christians will say that the gospel is Jesus came to die for our sins so that he could forgive us so that we could receive eternal life. Those things are true. And yes, those things are awesome. But it's more than just that. Because we went, last week we went over how Jesus came to free the captives, set them free from their, their sinful slavery, from the slavery of the enemy, the other side. That's what redemption is. It's to free, the, in war terms, it's to free your people from the enemy. That's what redeeming is. They come, they're set free from the enemy. Jesus came to redeem us so that we no longer have to live under the things that we have gone through. And he empowers us by his grace. And yeah, it's awesome stuff. And so traditionally we talk about how it's just about setting us free. or It's just talking about how we receive eternal life and forgiveness of sin. But it's also setting the captive free healing the brokenhearted, yeah, it's more than just forgiveness and receiving eternal life. It's also receiving healing and freedom now in this life. That's even better news. And that's where we sometimes don't talk about that aspect of the gospel that Jesus suffered for us so that we don't have to continue living in our suffering. Ah, yes. And so I just want to invite you guys to turn to John, the book of John, John chapter 4, John chapter 4, because I want to talk about a story in the Bible, and many of you know this story. I want to talk about this story in the Bible because I think this story everyone can relate to in some form or another to this woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, because I don't know what you're going through in your life. I don't know what hardship is taking place, if there is any. If there's not, praise God. If you're free from your suffering and have already been healed because you're in Christ Jesus, awesome. But I also want to encourage you who still feel like you're trapped. Every single day is a struggle and a battle in your head with different thoughts like, I don't belong here. No one can really love me. I'm unlovable. I'm so lonely. And also surrounded by all the different situations and issues that are being presented. I even talked about last week how during COVID, now that everyone is not at work or at school, everyone is, the family, 
families at their homes are now having to face different um, struggles that have never been addressed. Different family issues that have never been addressed. And it's causing lots of divides and divorce rate has gone up. Domestic abuse has gone up. It's awful. And it's because there's never been an opportunity where people have allowed Jesus to come in and heal them and them to see through the, the lies that the enemy wants people to continue living under because since that people are continuing to live on the side of the enemy and they're continually, continually living from a place of hurt, alonement, abandonment, rejection, then they start seeking to be loved and to feel like they have some sort of worth in the things that will never give them that sense of worth and belonging. That's why addictions happen. That's why people go and do things that were like, why would that person ever do that? I would never expect them to do that. Well, it was because they live through their loneliness, through their rejection from past things, through previous hurt, and because they're living through that, the enemy is actually wanting them to continue to live through that so that they make more poor decisions to lead them through in more and more cycles of digging themselves deeper into these deep waters. No, 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 no. Jesus came to set you free from those cycles, and he came to heal you from the things that have happened to you beforehand. He promised that. So I'm going to talk about this story at the woman of Samaria at the well. And so Jesus and his disciples, they're traveling, and they're going through Samaria, and Jesus stops at this well, and the disciples, they go on ahead. So they're, they're in the town, but Jesus is now outside of the town where this well is. And it's, a, it's in mid-daylight. And this is going to be important to the story. Jesus is out there mid-daylight, so not many people are around because not many people go to draw water at this time of day because it's really hot. It's really hot. So, Jesus is out there, and a Samaritan woman, verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How could you even ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. See, there was actually historical beef that the Samaritans and Jews had, and I'm not going to get into that, but basically it was kind of absurd for Jesus to ask the Samaritan woman for a drink of water. They even drank out of different containers, so that was even, it was even more absurd to her, and he didn't even have a container, so why would Jesus, why would this Jew ask me for a drink of water, especially from, the, we don't even drink from the same containers. And so the woman thinks Jesus is absurd, but Jesus answered her in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Living water. I want to just back up and pause here about living water. Um, and I really, I just love the, how the Old Testament has so much typology. And if you don't know what that is, it's all about symbolism of things in the Old Testament that point to Jesus. Typology. It's a type of Jesus. And so one of the things that is in the Old Testament is the story of Moses when he strikes the rock. Okay? And when we think about this, Christ is our rock. That is a symbol of Christ. Because he is our foundation that we want to build our lives on, correct? Yes. Because if we're not building our house on the rock, we're building our house on the sand. If we're not building our, our house on Jesus and what he says, then we're building our house on the sand, which is our life circumstances, the things that we go through. Because when Peter was walking on water, whenever he looked at his situation and the waters that were around him and the storm that was submerging him, he began to sink. Why? Because he wasn't looking at Jesus. That's the, same, that's the same concept. Building your house on the rock versus the sand. But anyway, that's a whole different topic. But in the Old Testament, Jesus is the rock that gives us the living water. Because when Moses, Moses was instructed to hit the rock so that water would come out so that the Israelites could survive because there was no water around. So Jesus is the rock, and he's the provider of life. That's the symbolism there. Jesus is the provider of life. So when we think that Jesus doesn't have enough power and doesn't love us enough to give us life here now in this, 
this lifetime, not just in the next, then we're crazy and we're believing a lie. Because Jesus even says that I came to heal the brokenhearted and to set the captives free. That's his purpose. And so he's even talking to this Samaritan woman about this life-giving water that he wants to give her. And so verse 11, it says, Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself? As did also his sons and his flocks and his herds. Well, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. They will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of welling up water to eternal life. And so now this woman's kind of confused and thinks Jesus is a little weird. And she says, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty to have to keep coming to this, this well to draw water. So she missed the point that Jesus is talking about spiritual water. But this is the thing. Jesus is about to tell her something that no one, that maybe some of the people in the town knew. Let's actually continue. He, verse 16, he told her, go and call your husband and have him come back with you. And then she said, I have no husband. And then what does Jesus say? Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, the per- you've had five husbands. You've had five husbands. And the man you're actually living with is not your husband. What you've told me is true. I want to dig deep into this, this woman's life. She's had five husbands, and the person she's not living with is not actually her husband. You don't think people in the town didn't know about that? That's five people that she already had been married to. In fact, did you even know this? In the Old Testament, especially in the Jewish nations, divorce from a woman's standpoint was not really possible. And if she ever did really divorce her husband, then no one would ever want to have anything to do with her because that was against the law. It was only lawful for a man to find a reason to have divorce. And so the fact that she had five husbands shows this about her. And this is how she probably felt. That she was unlovable and that she had no self-worth because every single person that she tried to give herself to, they viewed her as trash. I don't need this person. In fact, this person has no value to me. And that happened to her five times. And then the person that she's currently living with, she's not even married to. Think about everything that she experienced. She probably felt alone, rejected, abandoned five times. How do you feel? Can you relate to that? Who even knows what else she had to go through? She she could have been abused. Either way, she was at a point where she wasn't even willing to draw water when everyone else does because she came at a time when no one else was there because she was probably ashamed that she was living with a man that she wasn't married to. Because if people saw her, they would say, oh, look, it's that woman again. That's what this person is going through. And Jesus is the one that meets her there. And he's offering this life-giving water to the very person that the Jewish system would have never offered help to. Because they would have viewed her as a sinner and that she deserved the things that she was going through because of her own sin. Where Jesus comes in and Jesus sees her as the woman who has been undesirable her whole life. And she's viewed herself that way. And he's now offering her this living water. Why? Because Jesus sees through the lie. My daughter, you have value and I love you. You have value and I love you. And because I love you, I'm willing to lay my life down to prove to you that you aren't abandoned by me that you aren't rejected by me. I love you. Jesus, 
after he says everything that the woman has ever done in her life. The woman says, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus declared, believe me, woman, there's a time coming where we will not worship the Father on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans, you worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is for the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has come now when the the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are a kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ, I know that he, when he comes, he will explain everything to us about this. And Jesus declares in front of her, I who speak to you right now am he. And after she had done that, after Jesus has said that, she runs to the city and declares that this man, the Messiah himself, Jesus, has come, said everything that she had ever done, yet was still offering her life because he saw value in her that no one else saw, especially the five people that she was married to at one point. And some of us believe that we don't have any value. Some of us believe that we don't have any purpose, that we're unlovable, that we're rejected, that we are alone. Those are lies because Jesus proves through these, the biblical narrative that since the very, before the very foundation of the earth, there was a plan for Jesus to die on the cross to give you eternal life, to forgive you of your trespasses, to take the place of the curse for you, and to prove that you have worth and that you can be free from the hurt and the pain that you're still trying to live through. When he's saying, no, 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 I came to free you of that. Stop believing that you're alone. Stop believing that you're rejected. Stop believing that you're unlovable because I love you. And because of what I did, that shows you that you're no longer rejected because I was rejected. You're no longer abandoned because I've, I've closed in the gap of the divide between the Father and us because of sin. I've closed that gap in so now you can come bo- before the throne boldly because I'm your high priest. I'm the mediator. So when you believe... When you believe that you are separated from God, when you believe that you're unlovable, when you believe that you're rejected and you'll never have any worth, those are lies that that the enemy wants you to believe over your life. No, that's not of God. In fact, Jesus shows in every single example, in every scripture that I've already quoted, in all his stories, that he actually goes to the sinner to show them that they have worth and value. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm just going to read straight up the scripture. Um, Starting in verse 8. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, not crowned with now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, whom through him everything exists. So the man who created everything, he saw it fitting for him to be the one to come down so that he should make the author of their salvation perfect through his suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call us his family. That's some good news. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the, congrega- of the congregation. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, I am, here I am and the, children, and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. So by his death, Jesus destroyed the power of death. That is the devil and freed 
Those who all their lives were held in the slavery of their fear of death, held in the slavery of the sin that they can't stop committing, held in the slavery of the things that have happened to them and all the circumstances that they're living through and the pain that they don't know how to let go. Jesus came to set you free. End of story. And he did that by becoming like us, suffering everything that, and by principle that we go through to show you that you have new life in him. That's some good news. Verse 16, for surely it is not the angels he helps, but the Abraham's descendants. We are Abraham's descendants, by the way. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful Savior and a faithful high priest in the service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. It's some good news. The gospel is powerful and the gospel is freeing. And if you ever have somebody say something that is not freeing and not all about hope and healing, that's not the gospel. That's people who are looking through circumstance, looking through the hurt of life, and they're telling you, oh yeah, like this is just as good as it gets. So, oh man, like I, I can't wait for heaven because this life sucks. No, because God died so that we could have new life now. This life doesn't have to be full of suffering. This life doesn't have to be full of hurt and pain and having us live through that. A life in Christ is a life fulfilled and satisfied. Why? Because Christ has filled us with him and his love and shows us that we are no longer abandoned, rejected alone. Well, Connor, like, Pastor Connor, what happens when, what happens when I have these, these thoughts of like, and, and everyone around me just seems to, to not want to be my friend, or uh, people around me, like my family doesn't show me love, um, all this stuff. That's the point. Jesus shows you that you are loved, and that you aren't abandoned. And when you look to the things around you to seek for that, that fulfillment, yeah, that's, that's vanity. It's all vanity because you're now looking to other people to satisfy the very thing that Jesus satisfied for you on the cross. When, you look, when you're living for people's affirmation, those are your idols. That's actually your, your Lord over your life. But that's why we need to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ because he is Lord over our life, not our circumstances. He is Lord over our life, not our feelings about how we feel about ourselves. What Jesus did on the cross speaks a better word over our lives than what we may think or feel. And that's the truth, because Jesus on the cross dictates reality. And the reality is, is that you are loved. Some of you may not believe it today, but I hope that by the end of this sermon that you talk to God and you receive you receive the love that Jesus has always seen you through that lens. That you are his child and that he does love you. And that he wants to set you free from those things that you're holding on to. And like I said last week, sometimes we hold on to these hurts and these pains because it's, it's our safe place. Because we, we want to be the ones to control it. No, 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 no. Jesus wants you to be free from that. And so give it to, give it to Jesus. Stop living from what from what your dad did to you years ago. Stop living under, under the things that that person did to you years ago. God gives us his love. God gives us belonging. God gives us purpose. And when we receive that, that's why we're able to forgive others because maybe they didn't really understand what they were doing. Because Jesus has seen us through a lens of love. That's why he was able to forgive us and say, forgive them for they do not know what they even do. I just want to pray this over to you today. I want to pray over to you today that, that the Holy Spirit can convict you. And that you can receive the healing and the freedom through Christ and what he declares on the cross for you today. 
And I just pray that you receive that. And just like last week, I just pray that um, you guys go to just by yourself, talk to God. Talk to God. Tell, meet, he meets you where you're at. He meets you where you're at. If you're going through suffering, if you have pains, if, if, it's, if it's been all your life that you've been trying to forgive that one individual because of what they did to you, and you still haven't fully forgiven them, talk to God. Why? If, if God, if Christ was faithful enough to die for us when we were still living in deception as sinners, how much more faithful will he be to offer you healing and freedom when you actually seek for the righteousness that he wants to give you? What? Jesus was faithful enough to die for you while you were still a child of disobedience? How much more faithful will he be when you actually seek for the freedom and healing that he promises for his children? I just invite you after today to receive the love and that by his wounds we are healed. Not because we may feel it, but because you say it. Amen? Not because our circumstances dictate it. There may be a storm raging. There may be, we may be walking, trying to walk on water. Guess what? Look to Jesus. I, wanna, I actually want to close with this. Let's go to Colossians. Oh, not Colossians. 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. If we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to leave you here with this practical thing that we can do. When we, when we go here on out. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. It says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Yeah, we live in this world. We live in this world where because one man sinned, yeah, the ramifications of this world are all about deterioration. We, we have bodies that deteriorate. We have things around us. We have mor morals deteriorate. We live in this world, yeah? But guess what? We don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, then they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. How do we do that? Because we take every thought captive into the obedience of Christ. The obedience of Christ. We take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. In the Greek, it's a genitive, so it's Christ's obedience. So we take every thought captive because what was, what was the thing about, that we read about earlier about Christ? He lived a perfect life. So he lived a perfectly obedient life because we were children of disobedience and it was impossible for us to keep full obedience. So he himself found it fitting that he, from the, before the foundation of the world, the plan was that he would come, be the person who was an, a Jew and a human living in a, he was a deity dwelling in a human body so that he could die an obedient death completely innocent so that we could be viewed as the innocent ones. That's why it's good news. And so when we take every thought captive to his obedience, it's to his obedience, not necessarily ours, his obedience. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, when you have a thought like, I don't belong here, that's not true because Jesus proved through his obedience that he, you have value because he sought it so much so that, you, that he wanted to prove to you that you did have value. Well, I, I, I was just rejected by this person or, or I've been abandoned by my entire family. Well, guess what? Because of what Jesus did through his obedience, you now have been bought and adopted into a spiritual family so you no longer are alone. Amen? That's why the gospel is such good news. It's not just about eternal life and forgiveness. It's a whole new life where we are completely satisfied in him. So I just wanted to leave you with that. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. He is our faithful high priest and in every single way, he is experienced in some form of another by principle what we go through in life. 
And he wants to offer you that healing and freedom today. So I just pray, let's just, I'm just going to pray over you. Father, I just pray that you be with everyone who's watching. God, that they see that through the fulfillment and what you did on the cross, that proves to them that they do have value, that they do have worth, because you saw them as an individual, that you loved them to the very core of your being, so much so that you were willing to come and die the death that we all deserved to prove so. And by those wounds, we are healed from the things that have happened to us. And God, we come today, we come today to to release the things that we've been holding on to, God. Maybe we've been holding on to anger, wrath against somebody who did something wrong to us. We don't turn a blind, I'm not saying we turn a blind eye to justice. But God, you want more for us than just to live against, in animosity against other people. You, because we're really just chained down to our anger and, and the frustrations if we live that way, God. And you want us to be free in you, God, because you've completely satisfied us. We don't need anything anymore. In Christ, we don't, we're, not, we're not beggars anymore. All we owe people now is love because you've loved us. God, I claim this over everyone today who's listening. Be with them. And as they meet with you individually by themselves, I just pray that you reveal to them maybe they don't even know what they're holding on to or maybe they do. I just pray that you meet them there and you promise that you help them in their time of need and I just pray that you do. And I thank you how you're going to help the individuals who are listening in their lives to be freed from the chains of the things that have happened to them and to let chains fall by the power of your name. Amen.